But the one thing that I truly believe in is that you can really control your mind. If you put your mind to it, you can control your mind. So like I said, that serenity prayer, I want to change what I can, but what I can't change, that I have to accept. So this is something that I sit back and think, did I do my best that I could have? If the answer is yes, then you have to come to some peace uh, with that decision. The other piece is how do you bounce back is, that's not the end of life. Many times we have this very narrow vision, tunnel vision in life where we think this is exactly what it is. And it is not just with your career, it's also with relationships. And in relationships, when you're so fixated on an individual and you think that this is it, and many times I have seen instances where people have continued with broken relationships for years together. Because for them, this is it. I can't move out of it. But I'm trying to encourage you guys to think that options that are there in our lives are a lot. And you have to be able to condition your mind to say that if this doesn't work, I'm going to look at something else. And something else, you know, there is, some, there is a nice saying I heard somewhere. Obstacle is the key. Or obstacle is the way. So many times, if you're faced with obstacle, you tend to get daunted by it and get withdrawn. But many times, within the obstacle is actually the solution to how you can progress further in life. And the other option could be a better option than what you are fixated on. So what I would encourage you all to think is that this is not the end of life. This is it. Yes, you worked on it. You did the best you could. And you have to do the best you can. If you've not done your best, then you have to sort of introspect, reflect, and see what you could have done differently. But if you've done your best and it didn't work out, you didn't work out. You move on. Yeah, life is short. You've got to make the most of it. Thank you, sir. LNT for a company like EVAC was still in a progress stage, and LNT is a full set base, uh, full set base uh, industry. Okay, this is again a very good question. This is something that... So the first answer to... The first part of the question answer is that LNT was in its... Uh, you know, they were prepared to sell this. Because LNT's uh, uh, strategic initiative had shifted over time. This was a product category within LNT. Whereas LNT wanted, wants to be a project and a software company. It's a great company. It's a $20 billion company. Having been a part of LNT has served our company very well over the years. But LNT, for its uh, future, has de has decided sometime in the mid 2010s, 2015s, they said we are going to exit out of every product business. So the welding business, the uh, electrical business unit, the cutting tools business, and a couple other businesses which LNT had proactively decided that to the best bidder, we will sell it. They obviously had conditions. LNT is a very ethical company. They wanted to make sure that they're going to sell it to somebody who's not going to mess around with its employees, who has a vision of growing this company. Otherwise, you know, PEs are there who can buy it. They buy a company, they shed a lot of employees, they flip it at a higher valuation, they make a higher EVA, and then sell it to somebody else at a higher... It's like buying a stock at a low price and selling it at a higher price. But they didn't want to do that. Anyway, so come cut to the current issue. LNT wanted to sell. We as we are part of ESAR. I don't know if you are aware of ESAR. ESAR is one of the world's largest welding company, uh, global. And ESAR decided that they want to expand its footprint in India through the specialty welding industry. So EVAC was identified. And we went and met with Mr. A.M. Naik, who is the chairman of LNT for longer than I can remember. Um, and he's a legend himself. So the second part of the question, how easy was it? Uh, I have to say that it was relatively easy. I have been involved in an earlier acquisition, which was uh, when GE acquired Alstom. That was a global acquisition, very, very complicated. There were a lot of uh, stress between the people. But this one was a relatively easy acquisition because the data that was shared with us was very, very uh, exhaustive. We went through the data. We and our lawyers, you know, I was involved with the acquisition, so I joined the MLA. 
So our lawyers and L&T lawyers and the m &A team comprising of me from our side and a battery of m &A guys from l &T, we would sit through uh, reams and reams of paper in so many different hotels across uh, Mumbai over the uh, five to six months. But the data that was there was all very accurate and we asked a lot of questions, we got all the answers and we were convinced that the price that we were paying for this company was worth it. But more importantly, we believe that this company had a very strong future. Even though that in the last three years it was declining in sales. And the reason it was declining in sales because was because LNT, and maybe rightfully from their standpoint, was not investing in this company. LNT was not interested in growing this company. So when we came in, we made some quick fixes. You know, the, the employees were de uh, disheartened. The uh, the dealers were demotivated, the customers were complaining about supplies. So when we came in, uh, we made some quick fixes and things worked out. So, okay, so specialty value in general value. Okay, I'm just giving you a quick uh, fifty thousand feet over feet over view. It's a joining metal to metal. It's a joining activity. Whereas in specialty welding, what we are talking about is called reconditioning. What we are doing is we are applying a certain alloy on a foreign product to transfer the same properties that it had as its original, to give it uh, work hardening properties, which basically means that even after multiple uses, it is only going to get even more harder. So basically, the specialty welding is a, a you know, the normal welding electrode you can get at 100 rupees, 150 rupees a kg. Our products are sold at 8,000 to 10,000 rupees a kg because we put a lot of exotic metals in it. So things like niobium, molybdenum, nickel, these kind of things which give impart specific properties on the base metal on which it is applied to impart certain characteristics to basically take care of abrasive wear, impact wear, sliding wear. So these are the wear protection products that we make. That is known as specialty welding. Thank you. Really inspires in this video today. So my question is that you emphasize on pain. Right? So like uh, when you're working from scratch, it's very difficult to get along with people with same mindset and same vision that you have, that you possess. So can you enlighten something about this concept of team building from scratch? Uh, so, team building from scratch is about, uh, the way I look at it, is about having a common objective. So you can't pick any X, Y, and Z random person and say that, hey, look, it's nice to be, it's very uh, cool to be a team, so let's become a team, right? So you have to have like-minded people. You have to have a focus on the same goal. And then... When you have, so, so the 50% of the job is done if both of you, or all of you, have a uh, same goal in mind, an end objective that you want to attain. But then what you have to do is to discuss about the approaches that you will take. And as you go about discussing all of that, you will, you will realize that there are different strengths that different people bring to the table. You know, some person is probably good at a long-term strategy. Some person is good at day-to-day -day operations. Somebody is good at relationships. Uh, when I say relationship, I mean customer relationships and you know managing CRM. And there are some others uh, who are good at data analytics. All of that is required. So when you are forming a team to have uh, uh, you know attain a certain goal, the first objective is to have common uh, you know common objectives to the goal. If you have different objectives. And then the last part I want to add to this is uh, the attitude is very important. Uh, the attitude is when I say that, and this is something that I look for when I'm hiring people, that you know, while you have their CVs about what are their achievements, what are their education qualifications, uh, it goes for team as well, is whether the person has the right attitude to work with other people. Many times, and as I said, neurons and mind and all that. So there are different people with different mindsets. So a lot of people are very driven by their own personal objectives. And they, some of them are not very good at working in teams. 
So those will not work. So you have to be able to, when you're working from scratch to build a team, you have to keep some of these things in mind when you're selecting the people on the team. And also, if you are being picked on the team, you have to be able to determine that you are working in a team where these conflicts will not be there. And if you have the option, uh, then you should, if things don't work out right, then you should back off as well, is my advice. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, carry on, carry on. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, sir, I want to ask, what are the dangerous traits of a leader's career? What threats of leader's career? Threats. Traits. 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 Dangerous traits of a leader's career. Can you expand on that? I'm not very clear what the question is. So, before I answer that question, I want to also make this very clear that this word leader or leadership is a very abused word. You know, not, you know, you can't sit and say that this guy is a leader. I think there is an ability for every one of us to be leaders. If you are doing your job right, in the right way, you can be a leader, first of all. But I think your question is more around the concept of a corporate world and a leader who is leading a team. That's your question, right? And that's the, and what are the pitfalls that he faces? Right? All right. So, there are a lot of them. There can be some things which are very circumstantial and very, uh, shall I say, specific to an industry. But one of the biggest uh, pitfalls or traits, dangerous traits that are there is obsolescence. When I am saying obsolescence is that, think about Nokia. Okay? Nokia was the company that was running the uh, economy of Finland. It was something which was a star over there. And the people who worked for Nokia, we had a facility in India, in Chennai, a huge Nokia plant. Um, and they were leaders and they wanted to continue to do that, work, work in the same way. They completely missed the wave of technological change and they became obsolete. So one thing that I think about is the technological obsolescence. If you are not aware, uh, you know, to those changes externally, that is a pitfall that leaders should be uh, careful about. What should be watchful about? The same thing with BlackBerry. Those of you who are familiar with BlackBerry, it was a ubiquitous thing. I have been in global meetings in which nine out of ten people used to use BlackBerry, if not all ten. You know, and when Apple came with the touch phone, people scoffed at it. And how can you? I've got a proper keyboard where I can press and feel the buttons, but you are having a touch screen. How will that work? So, that technological obsolescence is one thing. The other dangerous trait, and if I'm getting you right, huh, is that the attitude of I, me, and myself. If you are going to be focused upon what is there in me, uh, in it for me to gain, then uh, you may be the position of a CEO or whatever, and the leadership position or even a department head. But if you are not, don't have the ability to take your team along with you, to make sure that everybody is being given respect and recognition. And you know, maybe I missed this point. One part that is so important that we have to always keep in mind in our normal day-to-day -day life and also in corporate life is recognition. We tend to feel that the guy is doing his job, he's earning his salary, so he's supposed to do that. So going back to your question on trade, we sometimes miss out on giving recognition for people, to people. Many times if the leader says, let's say, uh, you know, in my organization, for example, if I say I want to have a meeting on so-and-so date, I want all of you to come here. Whatever location, right? Many times people will not even want to uh, share that they have a personal uh, issue because of which they can't travel on a certain day. But you know, over a period of time, I have tried to do the changes where I hope that people are free to share that I can't come for this meeting, Devo, because I have got this, you know, my child's uh, 
annual day or whatever, which is important and I understand that. Because at the end of the day, the job that you are doing is something that you are immersed in, you are focused on, passionate about. But at the same time, you have family back home that you've got to take care of as well. And there are priorities. So if a leader does not take care of these personal requirements of the team, that is again a very dangerous trait. You know, I can go on and on till the cows come home on this, but I'll just tell you this. These things, if a leader is not uh, cognizant of, is not conscious about, he's not going to stay in that role for a long time. He's going to be called out and eventually uh, it will see his demise. Thank you. What makes you do adaptive? that uh, you told that from NDA to engineer and from engineer to industry. Sir, what is the nature of that? See, I, first of all, I want to tell you this, that I am not a Haley's Comet. Okay, I am not. And I stand here admitting to all of you that I have not done anything extraordinary. So please don't walk out of this room thinking that you met this big dude who has had this ability to adapt. I am not. A lot of people have done things like me. But what I think, uh, the way I rationalize it in my mind is, as I have said in my talk and to the question that Tanay I think asked, is that there are certain things which are in your control which you can, uh, you know, you have to do the best you can. But after a point in time, if you are seeing you are hitting a dead end, what option do you have? The option that you have is to wallow in pity and ro ro ke aap apne aake sujalo. Or you look at uh, an option which is, uh, you know, you find option B. Yeah? I hate to say that you should have a fallback. I don't think you should have a fallback. You should take risks. Like I took risks. Where the normal flow was, when I was growing up, be an engineer or doctor, uski padhai karo. And I had the option to do that. I had the means to do that. My, my brother, who, who was older than me, He's an orthopedic surgeon. He went the conventional way. But I wanted to take that risk. But if you take a risk, you have to be prepared to face the consequences because certain things will not work. So I don't say that if you take a risk, you should have a fallback option. I'd like, rather say that you should have a fall forward option. If you know the difference. So if you have fall forward means, you have to move on with it. You. Uh, you've taken the risk, it's not got it's not worked out, you look at something else. As long as you have done the analysis and you said that I could do whatever I could, you have to fight for it. There are certain things where you might think you've hit the dead end on that option. Okay? And Ketan and I are now dealing with one such option in our work uh, where you think you've hit a dead end and it's very easy for us to say that okay, right, right, this is not worked out, let's move out and do something else. But you have to exhaust every option. You have to fight with your backs against the wall to make sure that you never know. Some, something else you've not thought about could be the solution to it. Yeah, I can give you a lot of examples, but in the interest of time. So what, what I'm essentially trying to tell you is that adaptability is a trait that you can develop. It is, uh, leadership is a trait that you can develop. Nobody is born a leader. And trust me on that. A lot of people will say, I was born a leader. No. You can develop leadership skills. You can develop adapt, uh, adaptability skills. And today what is, what is absolutely certain, and this is something all of you have heard of, the only constant is change. Things are changing at a much faster rate than ever before in the world. So... If you are not able to adapt yourself to the changing world, I talked to you about obsolescence. A lot of companies have become obsolete because they did not keep track of uh, the changes, right? So, to your question about adaptability, I don't think I bring anything special to the table. I have just wisened up with my experiences in life that is diwar pe sir for ke kuch kaam nahi hone wala hai. I'd rather do something which is going to be of you something different and put your resources, mind, efforts towards that. If you have a good thing, then you have a good thing. If you have a good thing, then you have a good thing.
CEO and a director, <laughs> at the end of the day, do you get any time for yourself? And if you get so, how do you utilize the time? Question, the easiest question I've got. Okay. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I am into uh, a few things, non-work related, which give me, you know, for me this is, uh, a lot of people do meditation, a lot of people do something else. But for me, my meditation, I like to stay fit. So I am an avid runner. I work out regularly, I swim. And I hope that I'm going to be able to do a triathlon sometime, some Ironman competition. Um, that is one objective I have. Uh, I'm nowhere close to it though. But I do uh, try and stay fit. But the one that really is my passion is to spend time with my boys. I have two sons. Um, I spend a lot of time with them. I try and, um, you know, I, I learn from them. I try and teach them whatever I know. And it is very cathartic for me. In a very stressful job environment that I lead and a lot of travel that I have. And I was just telling ma'am that um, I just got back from a travel and I'm just waiting for jet lag to hit me. So I was just hoping it's not going to hit me in the middle of this conversation. So I'm going to continue to ramble on. Uh, but while I'm very grateful, you know, to the Almighty for giving me this opportunity in life um, to work in a company which I'm very passionate about, with a team which uh, is so passionate, but equally I'm um, very, very happy and I spend a lot of my time with my wife and kids. We travel a lot. I like to go to different countries, uh, experience different cultures. So. Yeah, some of these things I try and do. And you know, it is a misnomer to think that a CEO is always very busy. I can tell you in the entire company, the CEO is the freest person. <laughs> if there is a CEO who is very busy, then he not, does not have the ability to delegate. Right? And there is this uh, fascination for, you would have probably heard of this Neutron Jack, Jack Welch kind of a CEO who is out there. As a company, we try to stay below the radar. I don't do any press interviews. I keep getting uh, emails, calls, my office gets calls for press interviews. I don't want to do, you know, there are journals and all that. Uh, the best CEO of the um, middle income group company, you pay one lakh rupees, you will get that award. Those kind of things happen, but we are not interested in that. My job is to make sure that I take care of my team and I take care of my company, all right? And if I'm able to do that job well, I, uh, I do that by empowering my teams. If I have a set of leadership team uh, in my uh, L1 organization, I try and give delegate responsibility where they can take decisions. And believe me, most people have the best interest of the company in mind. You don't have to keep micromanaging everything. And if uh, they are doing, if they need help, they'll come to you. If you have an open door policy, which I believe I have, uh, then they will come to you and they'll ask you if they need any help. And in these five years that I have been the CEO of this company, I believe that I am the freest person available. Like if I was 11 or 12, I would like to talk to you. I would like to I'm just kidding. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's so. Uh, of course, the fitment to the job is important. You know, you have to be able to fit the job requirements, whether it is in terms of whatever is in the job description, the JD. You have to fit the job in terms of your education. For example, in our company, if you have to work in a commercial, in a, in a sales front line or a senior management role, you have to have an engineering background. Without that, you would be completely out of place. I don't think we have any non-engineer We don't have any non-engineer We have non-engineers in finance, but uh, in frontline uh, sales and market-facing marketing jobs, uh, there is no uh, non-engineer. So one is that requirement is there. Uh, then uh, I am not big on the name of the institute because I am not from a uh, very you know fancy institute. What I believe is this, uh, when I interview people, I look at their ability to learn, 
their ability to bounce back from failures. And I, I ask this question about not, I mean, it's a very fancy thing to say that, oh, okay, how many failures have you had and what have you learned from them? What I am trying to get to the bottom of is how do you deal with failures? And I am saying, uh, and, and this is about vulnerability. With my teams also, I share all of that I've shared with you. In some form or the other, my team is aware of uh, all of these experiences of mine. And I have no qualms in admitting that at a very tender age, when I was in my teens and I had this whole screw up with NDA, I went through a nervous breakdown. I did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I'm, uh, there is no, uh, this macho feeling to say that I don't care, you know, I, uh, you know, if that happened, so I just moved on. No, I did go through it after. So I want to, in an interview, I want to understand how that person deals with stuff in a vulnerable state. And finally, as I said earlier, also is about attitude. The attitude gives a lot of insight into whether the person can work as a as a team member and there are certain techniques and tools that you can employ in interviewing to understand um, and and I also look at and maybe I missed out talking to you guys on this is how does he bring his authentic self you know in an interview we all can do our best you know put on our best but I can tell you this is a smart interviewer can find out very quickly if you are putting on a show you can't put on a show for too long. So my advice to all of you is to bring your authentic self to the job every day. Very good.